Hello, everybody. Welcome to week 29 of the ENM 2020 course. Um, Town cannot be with us today because he has an important, another important thing to do. And uh, so he has asked me to um, just lead this conversation. And it's good because I did the presentation this week. So thank you very much, Mona, for being with us. And uh, let's try to discuss some of these questions. Uh, if you want to start with any of the questions, tell me. If no, I can just pick one of the yellow ones that we have here. Yes, you can choose one of those. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay, so uh, I have these questions highlighted. Uh, the question is, if I want to compare niche overlap using variables, is it useful to do a pre-model in Maxian or something like that to know the variables that explain better the model and then use these variables to compare nature overlap? Um, well, I think depend, it depends on, on, on the algorithm of nature overlap analysis that you're, do, you're using. If this algorithm is something like what ENM tools has, uh, in which you can use distinct other algorithms to create uh, the model, like Maxian or GLM or or I think domain or other algorithms, then it's probably yes, it's probably useful to do these kind of things. Explore your data, not only see the variables that you think are interesting based on biological implications but also like try to see if they are not too correlated and explore how they behave in a model with the algorithm you want to use i think it's useful and you can do it uh, in ellipsoid you can also do kind of a calibration of models and then you see which set of variables could perform better see i think uh this new back, it's not new, but it's recently published and tool NT box. Uh, it has a module for ellipsoid calibration. ellipsenm the package I presented, also has a module for uh, ellipsoid calibration models with ellipsoids. And then, but the thing is that I think NT box has a more refined algorithm to calibrate models. So. Um, for now, you can use those two options with ellipsoids. I don't, I don't really know if there is something like that with kernels, but at least you can explore how a kernel looks like with different variables and then use those. Although generally in ECOSPAD, for instance, you use a principal component as access for, for your comparisons. That's that's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a question, almost um, like a variable selection question. Do I need to do? Do I need to decide pre-select the variables? Um, yeah, it it sounds. It, this question can be applied more broadly to uh, variable selection in general, not just for a niche overlap. But yeah. Yeah. That's true, that's true. It's, it's important though, like selecting the variables, yeah. it's always important. Um, let's do another one. Here's another one that probably gonna require some discussion. Uh, yeah, I did mention this week that uh, the Fundamental niche will be something that tells us where, or the conditions where a species can maintain populations without immigration events. And it says, in the case of migratory species, how do you usually elaborate an ENM? <laughs> and I think there are different cases in migratory species because migratory species can be niche trackers which is they kind of follow the same conditions when they do the migration, or at least when 
in the places that they arrive during different seasons. And there are niche shifters, or at least they're called like that, which uh, basically move to places that not necessarily have the same environmental conditions in different seasons. And a friend of us recently uh, presented her dissertation, Kate Ingenlove. She uh, has been exploring these kind of questions uh, for several years already. And what she did was kind of like, uh, not a new algorithm, but at least she tried to produce models at different stages of the migration. And then that helped her to have a more realistic idea of what the niche looks like in every every season. And so that did that didn't even uh, didn't only give her better geographic representations, but also allow her to see that the different environmental reconstructions in different periods weren't that different, like in, in, in terms of environmental conditions, at least for some of the examples. So I think those ideas should be always have in mind when you're thinking about yeah. migratory species. This, um, the, the migratory, modeling migratory species reminded me of, of uh, Yoshi Nakazawa, uh, his work. Mm -hmm. uh, I think his paper was published in, in the AUK, the Ornithological Journal, and I can't remember, but he's, this is a, a dissertation, this was a dissertation chapter, if I remember well, not a side project <laughs> of Yoshi's, and he uh, modeled the ecological niche, niches of um, migratory uh, birds from South America to North America. So, um, yeah, he looked at niche shift versus, um, I guess, I don't know what he called <laughs> the other ones that don't shift their niche between, between the wintering grounds in South America and the breeding grounds in, in North America. So, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting because some species track, I, I guess it was niche trackers versus niche shifters or something like that in his paper. Um, yeah, some migratory species track the same, similar conditions, not the same, but similar conditions, whereas others shift their niche during, between breeding and, and wintering. Um, and this question, I guess, stemmed out of your, <laughs> your presentation about immigration events, which is slightly different or it is different than migratory, um, the question of how you model the ecological niche of migratory species. But I think mm -hmm. the question here is about migratory species. So we don't have to discuss immigration events, which I'm hard yeah, to. <laughs> yeah, just, just like to complement what you just said, uh, let's talk a little bit about immigration events. Uh, it, I was uh, referring to Imagine you have a big population of a species and then you have very small populations in some other places. Those small populations are probably there, uh, some of them because conditions are right, are correct for the species mm -hmm. to be there and they maintain their own populations without receiving other inputs from other populations. That's what I meant with mm -hmm. immigration events. But yeah. there are some populations that are there, or at least you can detect individuals of that species in those places just because the, some individuals from other populations go there mm -hmm. eventually probably they come back or probably mm -hmm. they stay in a small population but that that specific population will wouldn't increase their numbers if it wasn't for the other yeah. populations around that, yeah it's the uh, kind of the source sink the meta population approach or not approach but framework i guess exactly yeah yeah and it's really hard i mean this is you know we tr we we hope <laughs> or we try to train our models on source populations we don't really want the same populations in our models if we are 
considering if you know you want to model the fundamental or close to a fundamental niche for the species um, but it's so hard to figure out if if you are including you know uh, sink populations it's hard to figure that out so, yeah. yeah that's true uh, you never know because like there are some people that have suggested i think correctly that you you explore environmental conditions in different populations and considering your background and then you detect some of those points that appear to be outliers but that's the thing you never know that that, that those may be just extremes it's yeah they the may same. be local adaptation not necessarily sink populations they may be you know persistent populations in some some um, unusual or different than than average hab uh, environment but doesn't mean that they are sink populations they could be locally adapted yeah yeah cool exactly. <laughs> um let's see again another question do you want do you want one <laughs> do you prefer oh we can go down the list okay uh here's another one uh in line 20 27 90 it says, what will happen if a very restricted species is embedded within the distribution of a species with a very broad range? Their niche overlap will be one, but are these niches actually the same? And well, uh, if you remember uh, the formula or at least the ideas of how niche overlap is measured, it's, it's the relationship or the ratio between the intersected portions of the niche uh, over the union of the two niches or the conditions that are in the inside the two niches so it's not precisely that it's going to be one because if one species is very small and then the other really big the proportion that is intersected is going to be small as well so that is small proportion against the very big set of combined conditions is not going to be one never so the overlap is going to be a number that is not one it's smaller than one and that means this, those niches are not the same and it's it's it gives you an idea numerically that those niches are not the same to be one to to for the overlap to be one you need that the two niches match exactly each other like even the the shape and the and the way they are distributed in the environmental space or geographic space if you are measuring it there it should be uh exactly the same that's the only way you can obtain an overlap of one <clears throat> yeah that's a, a very technical question i don't think it requires so much discussion <laughs> um there, here's a question that probably i don't know how, how much you have been involved with abundance questions and niches and ecological niche modeling but this is about working uh in line 2794 it says working with abundance data isn't it better to compare kernel densities than ellipsoids what do you think Juan? have you been uh, thinking yeah, about those things i don't work with abundance data i don't have i don't my research my projects don't have don't have access to abundance data so i don't yeah i don't use abundance data um and so i'm not able to answer this question i i've seen i've seen occurrence data being used similarly to abundance data and that makes me uncomfortable <laughs> so when you know when gbif records are downloaded and then there's a you know probability density function applied to those to those or used with those data that that's so when it's not truly abundance data i don't think i don't think we should model ab abundance with opportunistic you know records gbif type uh, records but in this case you know if the if the, the participant <laughs> has uh, true abundance data 
from, I guess, repeated surveys. Um, I, I would say, again, I'm not, not my field. I would say it's probably better to use uh, kernel density, but I don't know. And yeah, I, I don't have a, a, the right answer either. Like if it's truly a abundance data, I don't know if uh, doing a kernel will be better than an LF. So probably kernels will allow you to, to see different groups or different patches of high concentration or high abundances which doesn't necessarily mean that uh that's true because like nature is biased so these places where where you don't have high abundance is it because there's no as sample as other places is it because like a lot of different complications so i don't know if it's true with if you're working with true abundances. What is not true is that if you're working with, with uh, occurrence data, like the type of data we use, even if you don't filter it and you assume more records mean more, mean more individuals, it's not safe to do a kernel density and represent that way abundances because those are records of individuals. If you can call something, if you can call that something, that will be incidences and not abundances. Incidences are not abundances and it just be counted like one and not 10 or 20, like a different number. And so I consider like ellipsoids safer than kernels in that, in that sense, but still you have bias there. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about ellipsoids is that they have been able to produce certain uh, results that are close to what the trend of abundance, the observed trend of, of abundance is. Uh, but I, again, I, uh, following all the ideas that we have said in this course, uh, it's very biased. Like all the records we have, have a, a, a huge amount of bias. And I don't know, I'm not comfortable with that either. Yeah, and, and when I, you know, when I read the papers that are are trying to model abundance, I I I don't know. I, I am concerned with the assumption that just purely abiotic variables can inform us about abundance of species. So, you know, when I think about about abundance, I think about population dynamics and to me, it's a big jump from saying here, here's a set of climatic variables that have something to do with uh, physiological limits of species and jumping from that to here's a set of climatic variables that can tell me where <laughs> there will be a higher concentration of individuals of a species. Because we know that has to do with biotic interactions, with dispersal. And yeah, so I think abundance is really hard to uh, to model, um, and I, I generally don't feel comfortable <laughs> using the ecological niche modeling framework for abundance modeling. It, I think it has to be a very special case where you're really, first of all, you really have abundance data, not just occurrence records that we are using as abundance, as uh, surrogates for abundance, I guess, surrogates for, for abundance. And so, yeah, first of all, data, like you said, and then second, I think, I think the modeling um, approach has to be more oriented towards population dynamics and less towards long-term stability in abiotic space of, of the, the species. So. Yeah. And as, I, and as I said, if you need to do, or you want to do a macro, macro representation of abundances in a huge area, just have those, those ideas in mind and don't go too deep in the discussion of predicted abundances. And mm -hmm. if you want to do that, use simple models. Like I think that will be the way to go. Kernels are too complex to represent things like that. They are too specific and they are too adjusted to uh, what the what the data is like and all the biases of the data. So you will be adjusting a model 
two biases. Having simpler models will, will allow you to explore better those ideas. That doesn't mean it's accurate, but at least won't be that biased. Yeah. Uh, let's see another one. We have this one. Okay, so in 2795, we have, I was curious about how to explore the information about the volume of the ellipsoid, even if it is not possible to rule out the null hypothesis, that is niche overlap. Is it possible to discuss the size of the niche and how can this be reflected in the distribution of the species being compared? I like that these questions because it's trying to think on how to use these representations of niche overlap more than just to say they overlap or not. And they, they are right, like the volume of the ellipsoid says something said something about how big is one niche compared to another. And I think it's useful, even if the niches do not overlap, if they have different volumes and if they have different, let's say, positions and shapes, uh, that says something about how a species is different than other. It's not just about how much they overlap, but also how qualitatively different they are. And again, like they are models, so we don't have to go so deep in interpretations, but at least it gives you something. Like if you have clear access, like precipitation and temperature and see that one species is here and the other one is here and the, their backgrounds or their, their combinations do not overlap, their available conditions do not overlap, then yes, they do not. You cannot say anything about overlapping or niche overlap. But you can talk about whether this volume is bigger or this one is smaller. But geographic implications of that are more complicated because environmental space is not uh, uniform. So you have more density of points in certain areas. And I think it's important to explore that as well before assuming that a bigger volume will represent larger geographic distributions. It's just a matter of, of, it's not just a matter of seeing how big the ellipsoid is, but the, the, the direct projection of that, it can only be done when you consider how many points are in that part of the cloud of environmental space. So if you are in a very dense region of the cloud, and if you have a small ellipsoid, that will probably be a very big distributional area in the geographic space. And if you have a very big ellipsoid, but it's in the corners, like the no, not too dense parts of the cloud, that, that probably means that like the distribution is small in terms of geographic dimension. Yeah, it's a cool question because, um, yeah, it's, it, it, but I think by default, we are inclined to think that if the niche volume is larger, the potential distribution or the geographic representation of that volume has to be larger, but not necessarily. So it's good that this question goes one step, you know, doesn't stop at the volume of the niche, also says, and how can this be reflected in geographic space? Because a lot of times we are interested in the application, the potential distribution. So we, we are interested in the geographic representation of the niche. So if we stop in, in the environmental space and say, oh, this species has a much larger volume, thus has a much, you know, let's think of two invasive species, you know, like, oh, this one has a much greater potential for invasion because it's, its volume, its niche volume is larger. Well, it turns out that it could actually, it, it might actually not be the case depending on, on that, you know, the, like you said, the density of the volume, where, the, where that volume is located in the, um, environmental space so yeah larger volume doesn't necessarily mean larger potential uh, geographic distribution yeah well it has another cool thing like all this like the Hutchinson and duality thinking about that it, it's cool because also reminds you that climatic conditions available climatic conditions even in the same area can change because of the time 
mm -hmm. you're thinking in the last glacial maximum, the same area will have very different conditions. And so imagine that those two ellipsoids, those two ellipsoids based on the uh, niche conservatism theory or ideas, they will maintain, they will be the same in, the, in different time periods or basically the same. They won't change that much. But clouds of points can change, like uh, available conditions can change in less glacial maximum or current bar, current conditions. So if they change and the density of points moves towards the other ellipsoid that you're thinking about, then things are gonna change. The real geographic implications of the same ball, the same niche of the same ellipsoid change when the time and when the conditions change. So <clears throat> that's why it's interesting to project niches to different time periods. We don't see that in the projection directly, but we should think about in the Hutchinsonian duality when we're doing it. Because it's, if, the, if the distribution increases or moves towards a different uh, region uh, or decreases, it's because of that. It's because of the cloud of points movement. And, and a friend of, uh, of mine and I are working on, on something that allows you to see in an ellipsoid how environmental conditions change when you project to the future and how you can see gaining of suitable conditions and loss and loss of suitable conditions can be seen in the in the environmental space and hmm. it kind of shows that uh, path that the, the climates are have when they're changing in, in in different time periods but yeah hmm. it's it's interesting so are you doing that with a virtual species or you have a volume an ellipsoid defined and then you uh, track climate change or well I guess you track the cha the climate uh, in that ellipsoid is that what you're doing or no? it's 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 a real species because uh -huh. you can like you can actually construct this ellipsoid with real species and just I put the climates of the current period and then the climates of the future period and I detect whether the same point that will be identified as the point in geographic space, changes uh -huh. in conditions. So it changes colors. It becomes red if it's gaining or blue if it's like it's. Mm -hmm. I'll show it next week probably. <laughs> I don't know okay. where I have that figure right now. <laughs> but it's interesting, and and I should have presented that in the in the in the presentation probably in the talk. But let's move to another question. Yes. <laughs> let's jump a little bit down here just in case we don't have time for answering all of those. Uh, let's do this one, 2810. Uh, how will be the representation of invasive species at accessible areas? Mm -hmm. They will be, they will appear at the borders of the accessible areas. Uh, will, will they appear at the borders of accessible areas? I think that's the question and just, mm -hmm. Uh, so what I did, Mona, was to show uh, a figure that presents accessible areas in the environmental space and then how the occurrence records are in that environmental space. And sometimes you have that the accessible area is big uh, in, in terms of environmental conditions and inside that it's well contained uh, all the occurrence records. And all the occurrence data set is well contained inside that cloud of accessible Access. environments. But a lot of times, and that's what happens a lot, is that they are at the border of the accessible area. So you have very hard time ca characterizing the niche of a species because of truncated curves and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and they're asking how that will look with uh, invasive species. And I think everything is a matter of how we are characterizing the accessible area in access in invaded areas right mm -hmm. and it's interesting because uh it depends on how much time the invasive species has been there because the species that has been like in a place for a year and the species doesn't have like that much dispersal capacity 
and like it's just few individuals then the accessible area is probably going to be very small because you have to actually consider what the species has been able to to access yeah but if it's a lot of time and the species has a very broad uh like very high capacity of dispersal then the area is going to change and i think it's easier in the second case because you're actually going to have more conditions to cover <coughs> the occurrences of the invasive species and i guess yeah you can have different scenarios you can yeah. have a species that is in the border like it's marginal compared to the available conditions or it's in the middle you have to explore it yeah yeah, and it depends on the invasive species. Um, a long time ago when I was a postdoc, I worked with aquatic invasive species and switching from terrestrial system to systems to aquatic, it was quite shocking for me because, uh, you know, dispersal is not a problem anymore. Boaters take, <laughs> take invasive species with them, you know, they spread them. Yeah, so it's dispersal on, on steroids. It's just, yeah no no limit from asia to europe to north america no problem with the ballast water um so yeah it depends on on what what invasive species um we work with in some cases dispersal is no limits <laughs> can reach anywhere within <laughs> 24 hours to to i don't know two weeks or three weeks yeah that's true that's true time time matters in in this sense as well <clears throat> yeah okay what about another question do you prefer one from all of this you mentioned a, a short question about pca i don't know you have if you have uh, that it's that handy. okay oh it's still it says okay. 2825. Mm -hmm. So it says, could you explain how to do a PCA with just one variable, precipitation or temperature? I thought that PCA was uh, could be used only when we have multiple variables. And yes, you're right. You can do it with multiple variables, and it's better if you do it with multiple variables. One of the main goals of PCAs are summarizing variability among those other row axes. And probably this confusion is because the example I did in which I had principal components representing temperature and principal components representing precipitation. And what I did was uh, a PCA from all the eight or something uh, bioclimatic variables that represent temperature conditions they are annual mean annual temperature or annual mean temperature then you have a maximum minimum uh, mean of the warmest quarter and stuff like that and i did the same for the bioclimatic precipitation variables so i had three principal components representing all those other temperature variables and three precipitation principal components representing all the other uh, presentation variables and I'd say that it's sometimes it's useful because those two are major uh, biological uh, predictors like uh, or variables let's say it like that and they have different implications but but yeah it's not that I did a principal component with just one variable okay good to clarify that one <laughs> yeah This is another good question as well, uh, 2819, it says, how can we take species mobility into account when comparing niche overlap? Is mobility implicitly included in the e and &M? And this is a question about M. <laughs> so uh, we can include it by directly establishing, establishing what's accessible or not and by creating a region that you consider should be 
the one that limits accessibility for a species. Uh, there are very different ways to do it. Uh, it's not implicitly considered in ENM, you have to do it, especially in correlative niche modeling. And when you are thinking about overlapping uh, of, of niches, I think it's important to consider accessible areas. You have to do it like people does it uh, using different techniques. Some of them use echo, echo regions, like they detect what ecoregions are being occupied by some records of the species and all of those together will be the accessible area. You can do buffers, convex holes, concave holes. Uh, you can draw a very good uh, uh, accessible area if you have enough knowledge of the species. Probably it's not too broadly distributed. Um, and yeah, but, but it's important because that determines whether, as you saw in the presentations, that is a critical thing when you are saying whether the overlaps observed is statistically significant or not when you do these kind of things. But yeah, you have to establish it, you have to define it. Yeah, even if we don't, even if we don't think of we should, <laughs> but in the case, of running models without thinking about dispersal or mobility, the area we select for training the model is our assumption of mobility. Even if we don't, like I said, we don't intend to make an assumption about mobility or dispersal, the mere fact that we set, you know, North America as the extent of our, our uh, training the model implies that we assume our species that we are studying is able or has been able to access the entire North American space. Um, so yeah, even if we don't want to or don't think about, um, about uh, mobility of species, the mechanics of running models uh, forces us to or, or implies that we, are, we, we made an assumption about mobility uh, of the species. Right. Yeah, better, to, better to make an assumption <laughs> and not just <laughs> say, oh, I don't know anything. I just run the model at the extent of, you know, world clean. <laughs> yeah, no, don't do that, please. Uh, that's very <laughs> bad for your models. You will have always very overfit, overfit models if you do things like that. Okay. And, and that was, that was, you know, when I was in grad school, when I started running models back in, you know, <laughs> 2002, um, yeah, I mean, we did that quite a lot. We just had some climate data available and, and yeah, I, what I'm trying to say is that the field has ev evolved, developed, grow, grown, matured, so we should, we should do that. We should mm -hmm. follow best, best practices. Um, yeah. Uh, here's another question, and this is about variables. Is it uh, in line 28, 28, 18, it says, is it correct to include categorical variables such as uh, digital elevation model or land use cover to visualize the fundamental niche, the realized niche, or is it better just to include climatic variables? And well, first, I don't think just climatic variables is like the answer. Sometimes you will need more than that. And sometimes other variables at different scales are, are more informative depending on the question. So climatic variables is what we usually do because we always think in this very macro ecological perspective. But, uh, and it's easy to do like kind of interpretations or get some data and, and create some figures. It's the default type of variables for dogs. <laughs> but when you're doing your research, you have to think in your species and what, what, what's best to represent in each. About categorical variables, uh, let's think about it. <laughs> depends, I think it depends on the algorithm, whether you can or cannot do it. I think Maxim can handle categorical variables probably things like MaxNet or other like these very sophisticated algorithms can do it. 
whether it's correct or not, uh, uh, it's a different question. Uh, digital elevation model, let's think about it. <laughs> I don't think the species can actually feel elevation. I think species can feel like pressure, atmospheric pressure, they can feel temperature, precipitation, humidity. And if you think about elevation, then it won't be a direct factor influencing a species. So including it or not depends on specifically on that. Do you want to use an indirect variable or do you want to use more direct variables? And, and using indirect variables has the risks because of like, imagine a very broad, broadly distributed species, elevations in the more temperate regions will be, will have temperature values very different to those in more tropical regions. And that has uh, huge implications because elevations is gonna say, okay, these two elevations mm -hmm. are good or, or, or no, are not good, even though they are the same elevation because, but because of the temperature, the temperature is it's changing in those two things. So I think it's better to think in more direct variables. And yeah. about land cover, those are categorical variables. And the problem is that ellipsoid, ellipsoids, they implicitly assume your variables are continuous because that will be something like one, two, three for mm -hmm. the classes you want, but it will be categorical and not continuous variables. I don't think in ellipsoids that will work. Um, and I don't know if kernels will work with that, but I don't think so either. Yeah. Um, also, DM. I I don't think DM is considered a categorical variable. Um, mm -hmm. It has, um, unless you have a really coarse DM where you have I don't know ten classes of elevation. Uh, I mean, nowadays DM is pretty much continuous at, and so we have one kilometer resolution DM, but then we are we. Are, the DM can go down to like 30 meters now, thanks to uh, radar, um, satellite-based radar. So DM is not necessarily, a, uh, I wouldn't call that a categorical variable. On the other hand, like you said, I think elevation has serious problems, not serious problems, but we use elevation. It's actually, it's actually like you said, the species is uh, sensitive to temperature, precipitation, vegetation, zonation, whatever. Not, not, not the fact that this pixel has a, an elevation value of, I don't know, 735 meters. So, but we do, I mean, a lot of models include elevation because we don't have maybe vegetation zonation. And we, we use it as a, you know, as a surrogate for something that we are missing. Generally, when we use it with, I mean, generally we use precipitation temperature and then we drop, we, you know, add elevation. And in that case, it's like, well, you know, we have, it, we have, we have temperature and elevation, uh, temperature and precipitation. We don't, uh, it's not more informative to, in my, my view, it's not that much more informative to inc include elevation. Um, the other, the land use, this is a, has been a constant battle. <laughs> The use of elevation in niche models, I, I mean, it's const honestly, it have, I get questions from students all the time about elevation. They really, really want to include elevation because this species is known to, um, in terms of habitat, is known to use, let's say, just shrubland, not agland, and not complete forest cover. Whatever the species habitat requirements are, the, you know, the the researcher wants to include uh, wants to include land cover as as a representation as a variable for that habitat condition or habitat preference. But I try really hard to reason <laughs> with researchers who want to use uh, want to use land cover that you know land cover is very it is changes quite fast and it's a tra transient um, kind of variable. And when we use 
many, many, many studies generally use uh, occurrence data that were collected over decades. And I just don't, when, when people throw in land cover from, you know, 2009 or land cover, more recent land cover with occurrence data from the last 30 to 40 years, I just, I, I try so hard to convince people not to do that. And if they are really adamant about doing that, at least, at least, uh, compare, uh, test for uh, changes in land use um, at those locations that you use as presences. So use a land cover from the 90s versus your land cover that you really want to use from 2009 or 2016. Just make sure that at least the occurrences that you are using are not, you know, in 1992, land cover was nice forest and now it's an ag land in 2016 and you are including that in the model and all of a sudden you are wrongly incorrectly associating a presence from 1992 to Agland in 2016. Um, so yeah I try really hard to convince people I mean you can use percent tree cover you can try to use other things but again it's these these change and if we don't have really recent data uh, presence data Associate, that we associate with these uh, with the land cover variable, we we are we run into the problem of making wrong associations between presence and a land cover data. So it's I'm realizing we're running out of time, and I have this <laughs> my agenda of please don't use land cover one year of land cover with forty years of occurrence data or even twenty years of occurrence data. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see another one. Probably the last one. Yep. <laughs> I don't know which one to pick. You pick one. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh -oh. Um, let's see. Which one did we not? Oh, these are, I'm looking for a short one. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure I understand this one, but <laughs> what the heck, let's, let's, uh, so 2807, the question is, can measures of niche similarity be transposed as a predictor for species distribution? So measures of niche similarity as a proxy for interspecific competition be transport as a, a transposed as a predictor for species distribution. Mm, hmm. So niche similarity would imply if you have um, so if you do a, a test of niche similarity and you are at the you are outside towards the low values of DNI, let's say if you do, if you do ENM um, tools, I guess. Uh, so if it's less similar than expected by chance, um, the value, then those two species have dissimilar niches. Um, then you are not in the interspecific competition situation. So you have to be, sorry, so then you have to be within that, that distribution of, of DNI to say that, um, that the niches appear to be similar. Um, and so then you have competition. Then you can assume that you have competition. And that can be transposed as a predictor for species distribution. I'm not sure how that can be transposed for. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, if you think in, in measurements, of pixel by pixel similarity of niches, probably you can use something like that. But like, like you have to really think about the consequences of using that kind of layer. Uh, let's think more in, <laughs> probably that's, that's the way they were thinking about it. Uh, using um, like a continuous layer produced by the competitor, the, comp the species that the other one is competing mm -hmm. with or probably one that is biologically relevant for the mm -hmm. other one, like host plants for, for butterflies or moths, for instance. Probably that 
probably that's what what they're trying to to say if you detect that there is overlap so they may be competing so can you use the other layer to predict the next one and are they yeah. interchangeable there are a lot of questions about it <laughs> <laughs> let's say let's say something i have i have really hard time believing that just because two niches overlap those species have to compete mm -hmm. let's first just say that the dimensions in which you are measuring niche are not necessarily dimensions in which <laughs> species compete because of all the complexities and heterogeneity that exist in an in an ecosystem itself so but let's go like a step further and say these are the jaguar and the um what's the other one puma con color what's the name of that oh uh name? mountain lion the mountain lion uh those are very big cats probably can eat something similar uh, and probably can compete if they coexist in a region. Mm -hmm. If you detect niche similarity in a specific circumstance, probably you can assume both are trying at least, or they both can use very similar or similar conditions. Uh, but that, again, that doesn't mean they compete. They, you know that they can compete because of their biological features or their natural history. But what people is seeing right now when they are studying this kind of question, that's why I mentioned these two cats, is that <clears throat> they can be in the same region. Just, they just mm -hmm. do not overlap at the same time. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So when the puma is there and the jaguar is not there, especially because the jaguar is like, it's kind of the dominant species. So when it goes there, the puma leaves and then it came back. Uh, now, are our ways to explore niche detailed enough to detect those things? I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, and if it's a space only, that's the way they do it. Heterogeneity in terms, in terms of time. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's partitioning the feeding niche, <laughs> exactly. the abiotic, the abiotic niche, we see similarity in the environmental uh, space, in the abiotic space, but then in geography, you have separation in, in a, um, along an axis that we, we didn't include in our model. So yeah, you're right. Um, similarity in environmental space doesn't mean similarity, doesn't mean competition in geographic space. The species can, coexist because they have other mechanisms of separating their need their other other axes of their niche not just the fundamental abiotic niche um, yeah yeah i mean i think it could be an interesting first approach say you have you study two plants that you don't know much about and you find similarity in environmental space then maybe you can you can target field studies at at these locations geographic loca locations that are should be where the species should be um overlapping the two species should be overlapping because of uh of niche similarity in environmental space and then you know you test your hypothesis that way in the field somehow um yeah it's interesting because i generally when i think about competition i think about known competitive interactions not I don't know anything about these two species. I don't know if they are, uh, you know, they are in a competition kind of relationship. Um, let me see if I can, if I can draw some hypothesis to test from ecological niche modeling, basically. Yeah, yeah. it's an interesting it's, question. It's an interesting question. Yes, just uh, again, like I think the message we always trying to transmit is. Uh, since we are viewing the world in this very macroecological perspective or scale, uh, our assumptions, our, our interpretations of results need to be careful and need to stop at some point. And of course, you can go more and more detailed in your work, but that's your that's your 
it's an advantage and a disadvantage and your limitation. It's an advantage mm -hmm. that you can be the world in this in this way because you can have a more general idea of things, but it's a limitation because you cannot start thinking. You, you shouldn't start thinking about uh, these kind of things. So deep, so detailed. Yeah. Yeah, but as you said, it's a good way to start sometimes. Then you then you can go to the field and actually see if they, these two plants uh, uh, compete or whether they are using some other mechanisms to coexist, like uh, like breed at different periods or 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 yeah. grow from seeds at different times or I don't know, so many things. Ecosystems yeah. are really complicated. <laughs> I, I think in a lot of times models are our models help us formulate hypotheses that then we actually should be testing. You know, we should we should look for mechanistic um, explanation of a hypothesis that we we generated based on on models. Yeah, that's it shouldn't be it shouldn't be the explanation of a process. Well, I mean, at macro macroecological scale and evolutionary scales, of course, we can use models as explanations uh, or testing hypotheses, but um, more narrow time, smaller uh, or local um, kind of questions like competition, I think I think models are our way of creating hypotheses that then we test by other means, not ecological image models. Yeah, and that's how it should be. Like science works like that. <laughs> it's a as it's a matter of several steps towards answering a question sometimes. Yeah. Okay, I think we're over out of time. time. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, Mona, for for being here, and thank you everybody for your questions. Hope you we can see you next week. Bye. Bye bye.